you to this the first of this year's series of general lectures. <coughs> I feel very honoured to be here, standing where I am. It's a feature of this School of Physics, the lecture of time, but they won't let you go. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, here I am to introduce our speaker tonight. David Jamison is a get my glasses, change glasses, I don't get this wrong. <coughs> he is Associate Professor and Reader in Physics in this school. He is the Director of the Microanalytical Research Centre, also in this school. <coughs> and he carries out research on a very small scale into various solid, uh, <coughs> solid materials. But all of that's quite irrelevant as far as we are tonight is concerned because he's going to talk to us as we can all read <coughs> about the global positioning system, Einstein and the jumbo jet. Before I actually, before I ask David to start, I'll just put up the list for those who'd like to see it lest it gets lost of the <coughs> rest of the program. Notice that <coughs> we have five lectures this year instead of the traditional four. <coughs> that is because we are honoured to have as a guest in the School of Physics <coughs> John Ellis, who is one of the senior members of the Theoretical research team into high energy and particle physics at the International Research Labs at CERN in Switzerland. And he has very kindly offered to give a lecture, and his will be the fourth one in the series, and Jeff Ocat will come in the fifth to wind the whole series up. Well, I shan't give you any further introduction to David because, as I say, it will be irrelevant, except to add that. He runs the July Lectures, so I welcome the organizer of the July Lectures to give the first one, David Jamison. Thank you, Thank you, Well, Graham, thank you very much. Okay, well, I'd uh, like to uh, start my uh, lecture tonight on the uh, global positioning system by just a little bit of an advertisement for physics. Uh, it's a truly remarkable lineup of topics uh, we have for you this year and it uh, illustrates the remarkable uh, versatility of physics. Not only does physics produce gadgets that so incredibly improve our lives, in fact so much so that it's impossible to imagine life without uh, an electron these days, but it also is capable of uh, providing deep insights into really fundamental questions about uh, the nature of the universe, where it came from and where it's going. So that's uh, a characteristic, I think, which is unique to physics, not only useful, but also profound. Okay, so tonight I've, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, Albert Einstein and the jumbo jet, a seemingly uh, unusual combination of uh, topics, but as we'll see, uh, Einstein, even though he um, introduced the theories I'm going to talk about uh, nearly 90 years ago now and uh, had never heard of jumbo jets, in fact in, uh, shortly after the turn of the century aircraft technology was pretty basic, but it's uh, extraordinary how his basic ideas are very important in uh, aviation today. So first of all, what is the GPS, the Global Positioning System? It's an array of uh, 24 satellites in uh, orbit around the Earth. Let me just get my uh, laser out of here. I've got to uh, get that. Um, and uh, they orbit about uh, 20,000 kilometres above the surface of the Earth in, and takes them about 12 hours to go round. That's a picture of one of them. And uh, there's a, a large facility in the United States which uh, looks after these uh, satellites, transmits signals up to them and makes sure they're all working properly. And the purpose of these satellites uh, is nothing more than to broadcast time signals, very accurate time signals. 
And these accurate time signals come down to the earth where they can be picked up by handheld receivers like this uh, in order to uh, record the time being transmitted by these satellites and uh, deduce your position on the surface of the earth. Um, this is a schematic uh, picture. It uh, looks like it's rather crowded up there with all these satellites going around the earth. And here's an advertiser's brochure showing the satellites signalling down to the uh, special integrated circuits that uh, are inside this receiver. The, uh, it's interesting that these uh, satellites um, were put into these particular orbits as a compromise. Um, the transmitters uh, have to be fairly strong in order for a uh, handheld receiver with a relatively small antenna like this to be able to pick up the signals. <coughs> And they originally wanted to put them much, up much higher, but that would have made them much heavier. So this 20,000-kilometre uh, orbit is a compromise against uh, signal strength and weight of receiver, uh, weight of uh, transmitter. And in fact, by coincidence, the uh, satellites all orbit inside the Van Allen radiation belts of the Earth, so they're continually getting uh, bombarded. The satellites are continually being bom bombarded by high-energy particles. And if those of you who were here in 1996 uh, will have heard me talk about the consequences for electronics when it's bombarded by these high energy particles. So the electronics inside these satellites is rather special. It's called, it's all radiation hard electronics so that it doesn't get uh, disrupted by the intense radiation coming from the, uh, the Van Allen belts around the Earth. And the Van Allen belts, of course, are the regions in the magnetic field where charged particles from the sun are trapped and uh, and continuously oscillate backwards and forwards, bombarding anything that passes through there. And uh, I have to say, uh, who made it? Um, it's, it was made uh, by the Americans, uh, although there is also a uh, Russian equivalent to this system now. Um, by, it was made in particular by the uh, Aerospace Corporation under contract to the US military. Uh, it's become fully operational just in the last few years, uh, but the first ideas for this sort of uh, system, this artificial constellation of navigation stars, hence its uh, occasional name Navstar. Uh, the first ideas were put forward back in the 60s and so it's been a long time <coughs> coming. It also costs a prodigious sum of money, about $10 billion in order to get the 24 satellites up there with their accurate clocks and the uh, maintenance of the, uh, and construction and maintenance of the ground station in the United States that looks after it all. Now, of course, since it became operational, the uh, commercial possibilities of this system for accurate navigation uh, became immediately obvious, and the Americans now have been forced to promise to give us 10 years' notice if they ever have to turn it off for any reason. That includes economics, um, because uh, so many uh, commercial activities are now dependent on having this thing working um, in order to, uh, to be economic. And, if, and because of this widespread application of this system in the commercial sphere, it's now jointly administered by both the uh, military and civil authorities in the states. So, okay, what is, this, uh, what is this very expensive and very elaborate, as we will see, system? What is it for? Well, it's for basically for navigation. If you're traveling in remote areas, uh, both on land or on sea, um, or in the air, where there are no landmarks, it's fabulously valuable to be able to just uh, pick up your handheld receiver and know exactly where you are, without reference to any uh, looking outside apart from receiving the radio signals. Um, I did a literature search on the uh, web uh, a few weeks ago, uh, just on global positioning system, and it turned up hundreds and hundreds of publications on diverse topics, including fish. These uh, people have been tracking uh, bluefin tuna with a global positioning system um, navigation aids, uh, tracking sheep wandering around paddocks in the outback of Wales, uh, looking, uh, uh, looking at taxis moving around the suburban area and being able to instantly find them if they get stolen. And of course, uh, one of the biggest applications for the GPS is tracking the movement of the surface of the earth. With one of these handheld receivers and a couple of uh, enhancements, you can actually measure over a few, um, a few, a short time scale, a few weeks, the movement of the continental drift as, it, uh, as the continents drift about on the surface of the planet. That's how accurate it is. And of course, we mustn't forget the military who actually made it. The US military use it occasionally, but I suspect the military applications will be 
eclipsed by the commercial and scientific applications of this system uh, soon if it hasn't happened already. This uh, schematic diagram here gives you a, a quick idea of how it works. Here's a satellite, here's another satellite. They both uh, transmit a signal. Uh, you can determine from that signal how far away the satellites are from where you're standing um, and that uh, puts you anywhere on this uh, sphere and or anywhere on this sphere and where the two spheres intersect is uh, where, you're, where you're located. Now, before I can uh, explain to you um, how it works, I have to just remind you of a few facts about light. Uh, hence the black background here. This is just a quick revision uh, uh, slide for you. Uh, when I say light, of course, as a physicist, I don't really just mean light as in ordinary light that we see by, I also mean, and I'll call that real light, I also mean uh, radio waves and all sorts of other phenomena like X-rays, gamma rays, microwaves that come out of your oven at home. In fact, any sort of electromagnetic wave, not, uh, not necessarily just visible light. The properties of all these different types of uh, electromagnetic radiation um, are basically the same. They're basically propagating fields of electricity, uh, of electric fields and magnetic fields and those of you who can remember back to 1990, my first July lecture will remember that if you're here. If not, um, you can visualise, try and visualise it as just uh, particles or waves of uh, energy uh, propagating through space. That's what I mean by light. The speed of this uh, radiation, this energy, is uh, always the same regardless of what energy it has, what colour it is or what you call it. It's always... Uh, 299,792,458 metres per second exactly in a vacuum. Uh, and this is by definition uh, of the metre. The metre is defined so that the light propagates with this exact speed. So the speed of light is used as our standard of reference for measurement. And for those of you who find it hard to get your mind away, uh, mind around all those numbers, that's just one billion kilometres an hour. That's pretty fast, uh, but it is nevertheless not infinitely fast, it's, it's, it has a finite speed. And in fact, I was amazed when I was talking to one of my colleagues who's an astronomer, and we were talking about uh, light and the speed of light and the universe and everything, and uh, she said, you know, it's amazing how slow light is, isn't it? <laughs> a billion kilometres an hour, <laughs> it's not slow. But of course, if you're an astronomer, you're used to thinking on scales of thousands, millions, and even billions, tens of billions of light years. And you know, it's surprising that our universe is so big and it takes light such a heck of a long time to move around it. So on that scale, you'd think that's actually rather slow. But anyway, it's, uh, it's pretty fast for me. Um, just for the purposes of this lecture, I'd like you to uh, be a bit flexible about how you visualise you know, what light actually is. If you could look at it up close with advanced uh, sensors, not your own sensors, but super microscopes or something. You could visualise it either as little, uh, little particles zooming around everywhere, so you could try and visualise my laser here as firing out little red, little red uh, particles which zoom along and bounce off the screen and reflect back into your eyes. Or you could imagine this uh, sends out waves of red sort of oscillation which bounce off the screen and down into your eyes. So these are two uh, complementary but uh, uh, equivalent ways of looking at, at light. What it really is, of course, is uh, something else. Now, I have to ask the question, uh, how does the uh, GPS system work? It's deeply tied up with the speed of light. Let me try and explain. Imagine that you're located uh, on the surface of the planet here somewhere. Uh, I've chosen uh, the city of Lisbon in Portugal for this application, since this will be of direct relevance to me next uh, Saturday afternoon. And, um, not tomorrow, next week. And um, there are two uh, GPS satellites uh, in the sky above where you are. And you check your clock, your watch, and you notice it says 10.15. And simultaneously, the clocks in the two satellites will also say 10.15, because all these clocks you'd like, uh, you'd like to think were synchronised, and indeed they are synchronised. And what the uh, GPS satellites do now is transmit that piece of information. Their clock now reads 10.15 exactly, and they transmit that on a radio wave. 
and uh, whoops, wrong wave, sorry. And that radio wave propagates out into space, down to the surface of the Earth, where at uh, some time, maybe this is a bit better here, as you can see here, the, um, the signal that says 1015 coming from the, uh, this satellite up here reaches where you are standing uh, down here in uh, Lisbon. This satellite down here uh, perhaps is a little bit further away and so its time signal propagating along at the speed of light um, because it's further away hasn't quite reached you yet. Okay, so there's a bit of a delay and um, it, uh, the original uh, satellite uh, time signal that says 1015 has now gone past you when the uh, second satellite's time signal saying 1015 reaches you. Okay, so these red lines represent the position of the time signal as it propagates out from the satellite with the label 1015. So your clock down here on the Earth, when it receives um, the signal from this satellite here, is going to read 1015. They're going to see the signal arriving uh, after 1015, and so this this satellite will the signal from this satellite will read 1015 plus a little bit, a little bit given by the difference um, in distance between these two satellites in my diagram there. So uh, basically what you can do now is uh, your clock will have uh, ticked on beyond 1015 when you receive the uh, 1015 from the satellite. So you can use the difference in time between what your clock reads and what you pick up from the satellite when it says 1015 to know how far away the satellite is because the light signal propagated at the speed of light uh, you know how long it took to get to you, hence you can deduce the distance from you to the satellite, which is of the order of 20,000 kilometres up in the sky. So if we're going to use this information, the distance you are from the satellite, and, and of course the time signal also encodes the uh, position of the satellite as well, not just the time, also the position of the satellite, um, you could deduce your absolute position on the surface of the Earth, your latitude, your longitude and your altitude from the, from the time signals from three satellites. You need three satellites if you're going to deduce these three unknowns. However, the clock in your uh, global positioning receiver, your handheld unit, is not as fancy as the clocks up in the satellites. They're very fancy clocks indeed. This is just a cheap and nasty quartz clock in here that doesn't keep particularly good time. So you actually don't, since you don't know the precise time that this is reading, you actually have to have a fourth satellite because you need to deduce the uh, correct time to correct the inaccurate clock that's built into your receiver. So you need the signal from four satellites. You've got the position, the distance you are from four satellites. That gives you um, four pieces of information. You've got four pieces of unknown information and hence you can deduce these four unknowns from these four knowns. And uh, this is a schematic picture. Here's the uh, aeroplane here with its altitude, latitude and longitude and also the time uh, being computed from the signals from these four satellites. Now, what is the accuracy of doing this? The accuracy, the error in the position is going to be equal to the speed of light times the error in the time signal that you receive from the satellites. And if the clocks on the satellites have an error of a billionth of a second, a billionth of a second, then you multiply that by the speed of light and that would lead to a position error of 30 centimetres, which is actually not very much. But uh, we would still, uh, that it still could be significant if you're using the global positioning system to navigate your aircraft and you're coming down to land and the aircraft tries to land 30 centimetres deeper than the surface of the runway, it could be a problem. So um, Let's uh, look more carefully now at what it takes to have an accurate uh, GPS system. And we have to uh, ask about uh, the role of Galileo and Newton in this because if you try and construct such a system based on um, Galileo, and Galileo and Newton, you're going to run into trouble. First of all, let me talk about Galileo. Galileo, one of the pioneer, pioneering physicists, uh, he... Um, had the whole field to himself. He started off, he overturned all the old ideas that had been hanging around for thousands of years and finally uh, put physics on a firm footing and uh, started uh, working out really the way things worked. One of the most important things that uh, Galileo figured out was that the laws of physics don't depend on absolute motion. And this is going to have profound implications for us yeah, for the global positioning system, this idea. And I can show you uh, what Galileo did 
he basically set up a, um, a uh, nice little uh, racetrack like this, uh, and he put a, it's probably not a matchbox car, but it's whatever existed back in the uh, 15, uh, 17th century, and he's, he did some experiments like this. He let it go from there, and he observed that it rose to exactly the same height on the other side after he released it. Okay, so I'll do that again for you. They're all oh, yeah, exactly the same height. <laughs> set yourself in motion unless you're moving relative to something, something that you've pushed on. Okay, so that's Newton. The, uh, and, a, and a further example of that, which uh, I found in uh, aviation, is this rather nice picture here. Can you tell from that top picture there 
whether those people are coasting along at twice the speed of sound or whether they're parked on the runway at uh, Heathrow. They're actually in a Concorde. And I'll read you the caption. More posh plonk, madam. Twice the speed of sound and not a drop spilled! Exclamation mark. So indeed, the uh, steward there is doing an experiment. The aircraft is moving at uh, twice the speed of sound, 2,000 kilometres an hour, and he's pouring a liquid into the glass. And of course, as soon as the liquid leaves the bottle, it doesn't suddenly go splash into the passenger's <laughs> face at uh, 2,000 kilometres an hour. She'd probably ask for her money back if that did happen. And indeed, he's testing the fact that the laws of physics don't depend on any uh, absolute uh, speed. They don't know that they're coasting along at 2,000 kilometres an hour unless they look out the window. There isn't anything they can do inside that aircraft to measure that 2,000 kilometre an hour speed relative to the ground because all the laws of physics are uh, complete inside that uh, aircraft. We'll get to this one down here where the tail's missing a little later on. <coughs> now, the next thing that... Uh, Newton said was that, okay, uh, I've, I, I, I affirm all these uh, things I've just told you there. The next thing he said that was that all clocks uh, everywhere in the universe tick in majestic synchronisation. You've got a clock here, you've got a clock over there, you've got a clock up there. They all tick beautifully together. As we'll see, this actually is wrong. So, still while we're on the topic of accuracy, let us now look at the difference between the accuracy of the GPS if Newtonian physics was correct compared to, of course, what Einstein said. First of all, you can get very accurate clocks readily available. Uh, atomic clocks stable to about one second in uh, 100, yeah, well, one with 13 zero seconds. That's a lot of seconds. Very, very stable clocks. Uh, one part in 10 to the 13, in fact. And in the future, one part in 10 to the 17 will be possible. Uh, these clocks are all based on uh, hot uh, atoms of cesium, which uh, glow with a particular uh, colour. And uh, by um, using advanced electronics, you can deduce a time signal from this uh, material and achieve this enormous accuracy. Now, uh, if these clocks ran, ran slow by 10 billionths of a second per day, you'd get three metres of a day uh, position error. <coughs> Keep that in mind. <clears throat> but non-Newtonian physics, the fact that Newtonian, Newton's ideas about clocks all ticking together in synchronisation actually contributes a thousand times greater error than that, than that. And so that is a very, very large error in the ticking of these uh, atomic clocks. You have to have Einstein for the whole thing to work. Uh, so let me give you an idea of the sort of accuracy you can obtain with the present system before I go on and talk about Einstein. Um, I tried doing a bit of navigating up and down Ligon Street um, and uh, with this very nice uh, GPS unit here and now I tell my colleagues I'd like you to meet me for lunch at that grid reference there. <laughs> <coughs> And the uh, last figure, that's uh, 37 degrees, uh, uh, 48.31 minutes south, that's the uh, latitude, 144 degrees, 58.19 minutes east, that's the longitude. And the last digit there uh, represents uh, a, a different, uh, changing that by one uh, changes the position by 18.6 metres, which is surely enough to identify that that is in fact uh, Papagino's in Ligon Street. <laughs> Alternatively, uh, I might say, oh, just for a change, why don't we meet at that one there? And uh, those of you who uh, also have GPS units will recognise that's Tiamo's, which is located 230 metres north of Papagino's, and we can see the latitude change from 48.31 here to 47.97. The longitude has changed a bit, not quite as much, uh, and the, uh, it shouldn't have changed very much, but that represents the accuracy of the system. So to test the accuracy even more, I tried measuring the coordinates of some well-known uh, Melbourne landmarks. Um, this is a uh, map of uh, the area around the university. The School of Physics is up here, and this is the exhibition buildings down here with the big uh, fountain out the front. Um, by um, putting the uh, GPS receiver here down uh, beside the fountain or down beside the School of Physics and I actually chose the uh, crown here which is located just out in the courtyard there near the uh, front door. The, um, that's the crown, the front, front door's over here and you're sitting over there somewhere. 
um, I recorded these positions. And you can see um, over three or four days, um, so therefore I'm using completely different satellites every day, uh, the unit was able to locate my position where these red dots indicate. And down here you can see the same for the uh, fountain in the exhibition buildings. There's a close-up. So here's the position of the crown and there are the coordinates uh, recorded by my handheld GPS receiver. So once it had me uh, down here in the education building, once it had me up here in the middle of the colleges, but most of them were very, very close to where I was supposed to be, less than uh, 100 or even 50 metres, which isn't a bad thing. It's not supposed to be that accurate. Likewise, the crown here, uh, the um, fountain down here in the exhibition buildings, uh, most of the readings were within uh, 50 or so metres of the object, which is uh, pretty good going. Okay, so now we ask, what role does Einstein have in all of this? Well, <clears throat> Einstein had these very nice theories of time, space and gravity, all of which are involved in the global positioning system. The first theory that will concern us tonight is the theory of special relativity which applies to fast objects or in fact any object which moves relative to you. And the second theory is the theory of general relativity which applies to high objects uh, in uh, gravitational fields and certainly applies to the GPS satellites. The results of both of these theories are absolutely essential for the, getting the accuracy of the global positioning system. We'll see that there are three important effects involved in uh, getting, the, uh, getting your position as accurate as I've just demonstrated with this handheld unit. The first is the phenomenon of time dilation. The fact that when two clocks move relatively to each other, uh, they run slow. The second is a more sophisticated concept, which is the relativity of simultaneity, which means that if two, two things happen at the same time seen by you, someone else may see them happen at different times, not simultaneously. And the third effect is the effect of gravity on the ticking of clocks. Um, the special theory was introduced by Einstein in 1905 and the general theory in 1915. And almost uh, the, it's an extraordinary intellectual accomplishment that he was able to work these things out uh, with so little, actually. So, be, so I can give you an insight into what these theories imply for the global positioning system. I have to ask the question, how does light behave? And the first thing I could say is, well, maybe light behaves like tennis balls. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, the, before I uh, describe the, um, the, uh, how we could test to see if light behaves like tennis balls, I just want to remind you of a few uh, things about electromagnetism. Uh, because light is an electromagnetic wave and uh, the thing about electromagnetism was that when, this, when electromagnetic phenomena began to be discovered around the uh, turn of the century, uh, about 97 years ago, uh, people thought that maybe the laws of electromagnetism could be used to actually do experiments while you're rolling along in fast cars or flying in concords in a sealed environment and measure your absolute speed. And the reason why people thought you could do that is very simple, it's the magnetic force. Here I have a vacuum tube which has got a beam of electrons rushing through it. Electrons are simply charged particles. And uh, I can show you that these speeding particles are strongly affected by a magnetic field. Here's a, a bar magnet and if I bring the bar magnet in, I think you can see that the, uh, I can't, I hope you can. The, uh, electrons, the path of the electrons is bent as a result of the magnetic field. And the amount by which the electrons bend depends on how strong the magnetic field is and how fast the electrons are going. So here we have an effect which depends on how fast you're going. If I turn the magnet around, using the other end now, the electrons bend in the opposite direction. So here we have a, a, a phenomenon of physics which depends on how fast you're going. As a further example of that, uh, here's uh, a couple of parallel wires made out of aluminium foil and I can pass a oh, I can pass a very high current through these two wires so that means I've now got electrons zooming along through these wires and as I turn up the current the moving electrons interact with each other through the magnetic force and the, the wires are pushed apart. It's a bit of a subtle effect. I have to use uh, 30 amps after you to see that. And if I reverse the direction of the current 
current in one of the wires, we see the opposite effect. The two wires are pulled together as a result of the moving electrons rushing through the wires. Okay. So we have forces here that depend on speed, on velocity. Unlike the situation in mechanics, unlike anything that uh, Galileo had. But that's not all. Here I've got two spheres um, that are made of uh, very light material and they're electrically conductive. And what I can do is charge these up. I'll charge these up and they repel each other by the electric force. See, they're now pushing each other apart. And as the charge slowly dissipates into the air here, they come back together again. So here's an example where two charged objects, because they have the same charge, they repel each other and stand apart. But these two charged objects are actually being carried around the sun by the speeding earth. And so you could regard these things as two currents of electricity flowing around the sun. And they, these two currents of electricity should attract each other in the same way that the two currents of electricity over here attracted each other. So people said, OK, all we have to do is charge these things up, hang them up, and see the magnetic force pull them together and try and uh, counteract the electric force which is pushing them apart. The trouble is, when people did that, no effect was observed. No effect from the speeding Earth carrying these two charged particles as a current around the Earth was observed. So it looked like electromagnetism wasn't going to be able to invalidate um, Galileo's ideas and Newton's ideas that in a closed environment, you can't measure how fast you're going because people tried and they did not succeed. But more detailed experiments were soon forthcoming. So let me try and give you an, uh, an insight into the importance of these questions. Let me turn those down again. Um, the first thing you want to ask about light, and hence electromagnetism, as I've demonstrated to you here, is whether light behaves like things you already know about, namely, say, tennis balls. So here I have a tennis player who, uh, there I have a tennis player, who hits this tennis ball at uh, 100 kilometres an hour. And so this tennis player is happy every time he hits the tennis ball if he sees it receding from him at a speed of 100 kilometres an hour because that's how fast he hits it. So let's repeat that experiment. This time we'll put the tennis player on top of a fast car which is moving 100 kilometres an hour to the right. The tennis player now, in hitting the tennis ball, is only able to cancel out the speed of the fast car and the tennis ball drops onto the ground with a speed of zero kilometres an hour because we've got 100 kilometres an hour to the right, 100 kilometres an hour to the left, they cancel out, the tennis ball drops onto the ground. But the tennis player is not unhappy because he sees the tennis ball receding from him at the usual speed, 100 kilometres an hour because he's being carried away from the from it by the speeding car. So as far as he's concerned, there's no difference to doing it standing on the car standing on the car, or standing on the ground. The tennis ball behaves in exactly the same way after he hits it. So you ask, well, maybe light behaves like that. Can I make the light coming from my laser pointer go faster by doing this? Blah! Blah! <laughs> right? And can I make it go slower by doing this? Blah! Until the photons just drop out and fall on the ground. Okay? So, no serious question. Let's do the experiment. You look out into space and you see a double star system. And double star systems are going very, very fast, some of them. The stars are very, very close, and if the closer you get to the, a star, the faster you have to go to hold yourself up against the pull of gravity. So if you look at these two double stars here, here's the Earth, you're looking at the uh, orbit, in the, in, you're in the plane of the orbit. At this particular point, you've got the red star going away from the Earth, and the yellow star going towards the Earth. So if light behaved like tennis balls, if I really was able to make light go faster by doing that, then you'd expect light from the red star would be going slower because it's going away from us, and light from the yellow star would be going faster because it's coming towards us. In other words, the light you might expect that the light retains the speed of the object that, tra that uh, emitted it. But of course this would mean that the light signals from those two stars would get out of synchronisation as it crossed the immense number of light years between us and any star. 
even a tiny, tiny difference in speed would be magnified to a huge difference in time by the time they reached the Earth. And instead of seeing the, t the double star system doing this, you'd see it do this. Split, in split into two, split into three, go backwards, go forwards, it would be a complete shambles and in fact you don't see that. When you look at a, a double star system over a long period of time, you see the stars do this. They go around each other beautifully, exactly as you'd expect them to. There is no difference in the arrival time of the light signals from the star on the left compared to the star on the right. Therefore, very carefully observed, you see that the speed of light does not depend on how fast the object is going that emitted it. So these observations show you cannot make light go faster by doing that because the light does not retain the speed of the object that emitted it. So we can cross that off straight away. Light does not behave like tennis balls. All right, no problem. Maybe light behaves like sound waves. Let me remind you of what sound waves do. Sound, the speed of sound in air is always Mach 1, uh, about 1,000 kilometres an hour. And it doesn't matter how fast the source, uh, how fast you're going when you emit the sound. If I run towards that wall and shout, hello, the hello propagates at a speed of thousand kilometres an hour in the air and it doesn't, doesn't retain the speed I was going at. So here we have the Concorde. <clears throat> the Concorde uh, cruises along at the speed of twice the speed of sound, which is, uh, as I've said, that's how fast it goes. That's very impressive. And we get back to this picture up here. Imagine you happen to be standing on the tail of the Concorde here. It's a bit windy, you know, 2,000 kilometre an hour wind blowing past here. And you happen to notice, a fairly common occurrence with Concords, that the tail has fallen off. <laughs> now, this is obviously, you need to communicate this very urgently to the pilot. And here's the pilot sitting up here at the front of the aircraft, so your instinct is to shout, hey, hey, the tail, the tail has fallen off. And you shout into the wind, because you want to shout towards the pilot. But your sound gets dumped into the air, whereupon it propagates along at the speed of sound, 1,000 kilometres an hour. And the aircraft, it's travelling at 2,000 kilometres an hour. And so your sound, your shout, gets left behind at the, dif at the difference in the speeds, which means it's being left behind at a speed of 1,000 kilometres an hour. So it doesn't matter how loud you shout, you simply cannot communicate with the pilot up ahead of you because the, the, the wind blows your sound back. OK. So if light behaves like that, you need now to do some experiments and you have to uh, propose some kind of medium for carrying the, the light around. Now we know that for sound you've got to have air and uh, sound propagates through air. Air has a particular sort of pressure. Uh, it's, it's made of uh, stuff, oxygen, nitrogen, argon, carbon dioxide, methane, all sorts of other things. It has a particular mass, you can weigh it. Uh, you can even breathe it. It's got lots of properties in addition to the essential property of carrying sound waves from your mouth to people's ears. So people said, OK, let's propose something for uh, light. We'll call it ether. Ether is to light, like air is to sound. And, uh, well, you know, uh, what are the properties of this stuff? You don't breathe it, obviously. Um, and uh, it has to fill all space, including the vacuum between the stars, because we can see starlight at night. Uh, but the Earth has been ploughing through this stuff for billions of years and hasn't slowed down very much, so it has to be pretty uh, insubstantial. It also has to be fantastically elastic because the uh, speed of light is so very, very fast, a billion kilometres an hour compared to a thousand uh, kilometres an hour for sound. And there didn't really seem to be any other properties, which was a bit of a worry. You know, you couldn't weigh it, you didn't know what it was made out of, um, you certainly couldn't breathe it. But anyway, people said, let's do some experiments. If we've got space, all space completely filled with ether, and here's the Earth zooming around through the ether, and the Earth actually moves at very high speed. In order to get from where we are now all the way around the sun and back again to where we are now in one year, we have to travel at 30 kilometres a second. 30 kilometres a second. There's another 30 kilometres. There's another 30 kilometres gone past. We're going very fast on this Earth. So, uh, a very delicate experiment was done in the States. They said, let's uh, shine a beam of light into the wind. 
where we expect to see it uh, blown back at us by the speed of the Earth, which is 30 kilometres a second. And let's propagate a beam of light sideways, which we don't expect to be blown back at us. And let's compare the speed of the light travelling sideways and the light travelling into the wind and see if we can measure the speed of the Earth relative to the ether, which fills all space. This is an absolute reference frame, an experiment we can do inside a sealed laboratory without looking outside. We're just measuring light going this way and light going this way at right angles. It's an experiment we can do to see that we're zooming along through space at this very high speed. Of course, in those days, they didn't know about galaxies. They didn't know the Earth was actually orbiting the Sun, which orbits the centre of the galaxy at a speed of 250 kilometres a second to get from here all the way around the galaxy and back again in only 50 million years or whatever it is. <laughs> they also didn't know that our galaxy is orbiting the centre of mass of our neighbourhood supercluster at a speed of 7,000 kilometres a second. And so if this experiment had have worked and there really was an ether, the result would have blown their minds because they would have said, where the hell did that speed come from? <laughs> so lucky for them, they found no difference. No difference between the light propagating sideways and the light propagating into the wind. The two guys were Michelson and Morley. Michelson was the boss. Morley was the guy who did all the work. They found, <laughs> they found no difference between these two speeds. And so you have to say now, light, therefore, does not behave like sound waves. It does not behave like sound waves. So let me summarise the results here. <coughs> Here's us. Here's them. Uh, we see ourselves standing still. We see them moving at the speed V to the right. The tennis ball is hit and it drops on the ground. Its speed cancelled out. It's travelling at zero. A sound wave travel, uh, travels at the speed of sound in the air because we're stationary relative to the air. Light, however, travels at the speed of light. C. C is the symbol for the speed of light. Them, on the other hand, the guy in the car and the guy standing on the roof, sees us being left behind at the speed of v to the left. I'll make that a negative number. Uh, they, they, them sees themselves, sorry about the grammar, uh, stationary, of course, it's them looking at themselves. Um, they see the tennis ball being left behind at a speed of 100 kilometres an hour, as per usual, as the way tennis balls behave after they're hit. They see the sound propagating in the air at the speed of sound minus the speed with which they're going because they're catching up to it but they still see light travelling at the speed of light. So, this brings us now to special relativity. Imagine you've got two spaceships, uh, one zooming towards the sun, one zooming away from the sun. We know that the laws of physics are the same for everybody. Galileo knew that, Newton knew that, and Einstein reaffirmed that. But we've got an additional piece of information that the speed of light is the same for everybody. So according to these two spaceships, they both see the light coming from the sun travelling at the speed of light. No difference. Even though they're clearly moving relative to each other, they nevertheless still see light travelling from the sun at the speed of light, even though one of them's going towards the sun and one's going away from the sun. How can that be? Well, it comes about because of time dilation. And so here are the three attributes of relativity that we need for the global positioning system. Let me just quickly go through them. First, time dilation, then simultaneity, and then finally, gravitational blue shift. I'm going to explain all of these from the point of view of the fact that the speed of light is the same for everybody. First of all, time dilation. Imagine you construct for yourself a very simple clock. <clears throat> and I can do that, I could do that in this lecture theatre, I could glue a mirror to the floor, I could glue a mirror to the roof, and I could take my laser and I could inject some photons into the gap between these two mirrors, and the photons would bounce up and down between the two mirrors, and every time the photon hit the bottom, the light, that is, hit the bottom clock, I could say that's one tick of my clock. So here's, here's a picture for you. So there's a photon going up, bouncing off the top mirror and returning to the bottom mirror. My clock just ticked once. Perfectly fine <coughs> clock using the speed of light as the time base and the distance between the two mirrors. But let me now repeat that light clock. So I want you to be visualising all the time 
photons bouncing up and down. I did this once, I glued a mirror to the roof there, had a mirror on the floor, and I banged two dusters together, filled them with chalk dust, and it was really quite effective. But uh, thanks to the cooperation of the menswear section of David Jones, I don't need to do this anymore. Uh, tomorrow morning, if you take your laser down to David Jones and go into the escalators that go up to the menswear section, uh, the escalators are lined with mirrors. So on the way up the escalator, just hold your laser up like this, and it's fantastic. You can see the photons disappearing to infinity in both directions as they bounce backwards and forwards. Excellent. But let's look at this experiment from the point of view of a spaceship parked out in space, stationary relative to the sun, who looks back and watches through the roof of our lecture theatre the ticking of our clock. The Earth, sorry, the Earth is moving sideways at a speed of 30 kilometres a second, and so this is what the spaceship sees as our clock ticks. The Earth moves as the photon moves, because the photon takes a finite amount of time to propagate from the bottom mirror to the top mirror. The Earth moves 30 kilometres a second. It's pretty fast. It moves a long way while the photon is trundling up there and trundling back down again. So the spaceship clock sees one tick of our clock go from there up to there and then back to there as the Earth moves sideways. But the spaceship might have an identical clock in, in an identical lecture theatre in the spaceship. And that clock is ticking with the photon bouncing straight up and down. But both of us see the photon propagating at the speed of light, c, one billion kilometres an hour. The same for everybody. So the spaceship observer says, hey, between ticks on my clock, it only has to go this short distance, but between ticks on your clock, it has to travel this long distance. So I conclude that your clock is running slow because your photons have further to go. This is the phenomenon of time dilation. In order for us both to record the same speed for the speed of light, the moving clock has to run slow. And this is a problem for the GPS because the clocks in the satellites are all zooming around and around the Earth at high speed relative to the surface of the Earth. And these clocks therefore run slow because of this phenomenon of time dilation. I've done the analysis there for a light clock, which is very simple, with a photon bouncing up and down between two mirrors. But of course, the result applies to any sort of clock. Human life process, quartz digital chronometer, radioactive material, anything, everything runs slow when it moves, as seen by somebody who's watching it move. So the next uh, phenomenon, the relativity of simultaneity. Big words, simple concept. Imagine I'm standing here, and actually this was on the relativity exam last semester. My students had to grapple with this in the exam. Imagine I'm standing in the middle of this lecture theatre and I position a student against that wall over there and another student against that wall over there and I let off a flash of light. And I carefully have positioned the two students so they're the same distance away from me, equidistant. So this red line represents, oh, whoops, sorry, wrong way. This red circle represents the light speeding away from the flash until it reaches the two students simultaneously because they're the same distance away from me. They both see the flash simultaneously. They both could write down the time. They had very accurate watches. When they received the clock, uh, received the uh, flash, they get together afterwards, compare notes, and see indeed they did see the flash simultaneously. But again, it's simultaneous. But again, let's look at this experiment seen from out in space by a spaceship parked out in space, watching the Earth go past at 30 kilometres a second. And there's the flash. It's just started propagating outwards. The speed of light always is the speed of light for all observers. So this spaceship sees the light flash propagating outwards at the speed of light. And I've left the earlier bits in so you can see it propagating out uniformly at the speed of light in all directions because that's the way light behaves, as I've shown. So in this situation, the Earth's moving to the, to the, uh, to the left. This means this student who's moving towards the flash is going to see it first. And sometime later, the second student will see it because that student is moving away from the flash. So the observer in the spaceship sees the students receive the flash of light at different times. 
they're not, the two flashes were not received simultaneously, even though they were from the vantage point of the lecture theatre. So the idea of simultaneity is relative depending on how fast you're going. This is a severe problem for the global positioning system because you'd like to be able to synchronise the clocks by this satellite telling this satellite what the time is, telling this satellite what the time is, telling this satellite what the time is, and when you get back to the first satellite, you find that there's a discrepancy. Even though uh, a discrepancy compared what, to what would happen if the satellites were just hanging in space and weren't orbiting. The fact that they're moving <coughs> means that you cannot, it's not commutative. A, synchronised with B, synchronised with C, synchronised with D, you find is no longer synchronised with A, even though you took care by exchanging beams of light, radio signal, signals to synchronise them. So that is another problem for the GPS. And the final problem is the gravitational blue shift. Again, this depends on, I'm going to uh, show this uh, <coughs> as uh, using time dilation, something I've already explained, and one other important piece of information. The, uh, this piece of information comes from Einstein's theory of general relativity. And this is a, a truly uh, remarkable theory, written down in 1915 for the first time. And very few people understood it, and even fewer understood its implications. And it remained for 40 years after its discovery by Einstein, an austere intellectual monument, somewhat sterile topic, isolated from the mainstream of physics and astronomy, whose practitioners were magnificent cultural ornaments. Oh yeah, Jeff uh, Opat, that reminds me, asked me to, oh, it's all, just a joke. Um, <coughs> Professor Opat is a practitioner of general relativity. But in the late 20th century, general relativity has become an engineering topic and if you go over to the engineering library, you find lots of papers on how to make use of general relativity in engineering devices. So, what is it? I want to introduce you to the idea of the equivalence principle. This is a remarkable phenomenon that was known to Newton, although he didn't know why this uh, occurred. First of all, if I have an uh, ordinary everyday object here, and I want to set this ordinary everyday object into motion, what do I do? Well, I pull on it. And uh, I pull on it, and I've got a spring here which is going to record how hard I'm pulling Oh, sorry. Uh, and the hardness with which I'm pulling uh, can be measured by the extension of the spring. So if I, set, if I, if I pull the string, spring so it extends by a, a constant amount, I accelerate this guy off. And the acceleration is proportional to the force uh, and the constant of proportionality we call the inertial mass, the resistance this thing sets up to be uh, <coughs> set in motion. That's one sort of force. There's another sort of force, if I now simply do this experiment, I hold him up and I let him go, uh, the spring extends a little bit. Just exaggerating a bit so you can see it there. Um, and so this guy is now subject to a force which is pulling him down. A force because of the gravity of the earth. And the gravity of the earth pulls on him uh, with the uh, force measured by the extension of the spring and there's a whole lot of constants there, but it includes what I'll call the gravitational mass. The gravitational mass. Now, the remarkable thing is, if I let him go, he falls. And he falls with an acceleration of about 10 metres per second per second. And if I do the same experiment, but this time laying on the bench, and I extend the spring by the same amount as it was extended when he was just hanging there, and Keep it extended at that. Oh, uh, keep it extended at that, that amount. I find that he also accelerates off at a speed of 10 meters per second per second. So we have the equivalence of these two masses. The degree to with which he's pulled by the Earth, and the resistance he puts up to being set in motion, are one and the same thing. But that's pretty bizarre. Why should the resistance he puts, he puts up to being set in motion, proportion, his uh, inertial mass, why should that be the same as the force by which the planet drags him down? I mean, we, after all, when we look at these uh, pith balls over here, we don't plug in the electrostatic force, the electrostatic charge, if we push them and try and set them in motion. 
but it seems gravity is different. Newton knew that the inertial mass, <coughs> the resistance to being set in motion, was the same as the gravitational mass, the degree to with which the planet pulls you down. And you can test this very, uh, he knew they were the same thing. And you can test this uh, very clearly by simply jumping off a high building. And as you, when you fall, you don't feel gravity anymore because all parts of you are accelerating downward at the same rate. So you're being pulled down and accelerated. The amount by which you're being accelerated depends on your inertial mass. And you feel completely weightless. All parts of you fall at the same rate because the inertial mass is the same as the gravitational mass. And I can demonstrate to this, this to you in the lecture theory. You don't actually have to go out and jump off a high building. I actually recommend against it. Um, here I've got a glass tube, and in this glass tube I've got a lump of lead and a feather. And if I just uh, put them both at the bottom here and just quickly flip that up the other way, there's the, the uh, bit of lead drops to the bottom and the feather follows sometime afterwards. Because, of course, the feather falls through the air and suffers from the effects of air resistance. So this is the physics department. I'll simply suck the air out of there get rid of that irritating uh, perturbation. So, it's alright. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just take a few moments to suck all the air out of there so that um, there's no air resistance. I should have got my colleague John Pierce to uh, lend me his computer simulation of this, but it's actually nicer to see it in real life. Anyway, you've got to ask the question, why is the inertial mass and the gravitational mass the same? Well, Einstein thought about this deeply and he said, I'm going to introduce an equivalence principle to explain this. He said, imagine you're in a laboratory on Earth and you're doing experiments with uh, light and objects falling and you study how they move. And then you take your laboratory and you put it in a fast spaceship with a powerful rocket motor which accelerates upwards with the same acceleration as objects fall if they're on the surface of the earth. And you know that when you accelerate you feel a force pushing you back. You feel as, you, as you, the object is going forwards it's, it's accelerating you. And you, you know if you're sitting on an aeroplane and they, you go about to take off and they wind the turbines up to maximum and you feel that thrilling force, you know, as the seat pushes against you. I love that feeling as you accelerate from zero to 300 kilometres an hour over the space of only a few hundred metres down the runway. And so the laboratory in the rocket behaves exactly the same as the laboratory on the Earth. Because it's accelerating, the instant you let something drop, the rest of you are still accelerating upwards and the object therefore hits the ground because it's not connected to the walls anymore. Likewise, as I'm standing here, I feel the floor pushing on my feet as if the floor is, is accelerating upwards and pushing me upwards. So I actually couldn't tell the difference if someone suddenly grabbed this lecture theatre, removed the entire planet so the gravitational force went away and, and, and just started pushing it up into the sky with a powerful rocket motor. Nothing would change. I would not be able to tell. I'm, there might be a little bit of vibration, maybe, or you know, the thundering of giant engines or something. But other than that, the laws of physics would be exactly the same. The apple would still fall. The beam of light would still do the amazing things it does. There'd be no difference. And so Einstein said these two things were equivalent, and that's the equivalence principle. So let me, I think I've got enough air out of here now. Let me see if I can repeat the experiment for you. There's the lead weight and the feather at the bottom there. Now let me invert it. Okay, I'll do that again. The feather and the lead weight fall at the same rate. It drops like a stone, literally, when the effects of air resistance are removed. That's the equivalence principle. So, with Einstein's idea that these two situations were exactly the same, we can now look for some effects on clocks due to gravity by modelling gravity with accelerations instead, which are easier to understand. Imagine you've got a turntable, a turntable which is rotating at high speed, okay? And therefore the rim of the turntable at this particular instant, this particular point on the rim, is travelling to the right with a high speed. And of course, it would go all the way around and come back again. But that particular point 
at that instant is going, going to the right. And you put it, you nail a clock down there. You nail a clock down there and you have another clock in the centre. Now, this clock is going to be moving fast. This clock is stationary and so, oh sorry, Graham. And so therefore, this clock, because it's moving fast, is going to suffer the effects of time dilation. It's going to run slowly. Now, this situation is uh, actually uh, exists. You can go down to Luna Park. Uh, I forget how much it costs to get in, but it's money well spent. And you can go into a device called a rotor. Uh, uh, gentlemen, if you try this, don't wear loose trousers, OK? I, it's uh, not a happy experience. But if you go in there, you go into the rotor. It's a giant cylinder. And you go and stand in this cylinder, and they set it rotating. And as it rotates, it gets faster and faster and faster. And of course, you, you get flung away from the centre. And so when it gets up to speed, you find yourself pinned against the wall by the rotating cylinder. And then the fun begins because the floor drops away. And the floor drops away and you're left stuck to the wall. You know, hold, held up only by your trousers. The friction between your trousers and the wall, and that's why you shouldn't wear loose ones, because it's not very comfortable. <laughs> and it's really uncanny. It's really uncanny because up feels like that way towards the people who are pinned to the opposite wall of the rotor. It doesn't feel like down there anymore because you're stuck against the wall, you can't move. And up feels like that way. So these people here have, are standing on a raised rim that has been constructed around the edge of the turntable. And as, it, as the turntable rotates, they're being pinned against the floor. They feel like they're standing on a floor. They, they feel like they're standing in a gravitational field. And this uh, this effect has so far only been used in science fiction, unfortunately, but one day may have an application for long space journeys. And this is what it might look like. This is a still from 2001. Here are the two astronauts in a spaceship on a long journey between the planets. And so that their bones don't waste away from the lack of gravity, there's a giant cylinder here. There's the axle of it. And the giant cylinder rotates. And as it rotates, of course, the centripetal force uh, uh, put on the floor, the the centripetal force of the floor pushing up against their feet keeps them moving in a circle and it feels like gravity is there. So their bones don't waste away. So in our rotating turntable, we've got our clock on the rim nailed down, feels a force from the rim, always trying to pull it towards the centre in order to keep it moving in a circle, a centripetal acceleration and hence a force. So this is exactly equivalent to the same situation as if we had one clock on the surface of the Earth pulled down by gravity and another clock high up in the air above it. That clock is the one high up in the air. There's the one which feels an acceleration pushing against it in the same way the floor pushes up against my feet, just like uh, here. But because the outer clock on the rim is running slow and the inner clock is therefore running fast, we can use the equivalence principle to say that these two clocks must behave in the same way and these two clocks must also behave in the same way. So we now have this, the problem for the global positioning system that high clocks, here the clocks high in the gravitational field, run fast compared to clocks down on the surface. So let me now summarise all the problems that I've introduced. First of all, global positioning system clocks run slow because they're moving fast compared to the surface of the Earth as they orbit twice a day. That amounts to about six millionths of a second per day because of time dilation. The second problem is that you cannot synchronise these clocks by the exchange of signals. This is actually called the Saganac effect, well-known problem in engineering because of special relativity and the relativity of simultaneity. Instead, the clocks are synchronised as if they were stationary and not rotating. And the third effect is that the GPS clocks in the satellites run fast by 45 millionths of a second as a result of the equivalence principle and the fact that high clocks in a gravitational field run fast. Uh, I call this the gravitational blue shift. 45 millionths of a second is a non-trivial amount of time the net effect from the general relativistic effect, 45 millionths of a second, and the special relativistic effect, 6 millionths of a second, in opposite directions, is that the 
net, the clocks run fast by a net amount of 30, 39 millionths of a second per day, which is a positional error of 12 kilometres. Not the sort of error you want if your aircraft is making a landing on a fog-bound runway, <coughs> it would be fatal. And the solution, the engineering solution adopted to solve these problems is to make the clocks artificially run slow, they're programmed to run slow, to compensate for the, the major effect which is from general relativity. So let me conclude by saying that I've, I hope I've demonstrated to you that the speed of light is the same for everybody, regardless of their state of relative motion. Consequently, moving clocks run slow, simultaneity is relative, and then the fact that the inertial mass is the same as the gravitational mass leads you to the equivalence principle, and the fact with time dilation that high clocks run fast. And these phenomena are built into the engineering principles behind the global positioning system, so it's truly said that Einstein is flying your <coughs> aircraft. Now, a lot of people don't like the idea that the speed of light is the same for everybody. How can that be true? Two people are in relative motion. How can they both measure the same speed for a photon going past? Fine, OK. Next time you're coming down to land in a Category 3 landing in an aircraft, and a Category 3 landing is a landing where the pilot can't see the runway until after the aircraft is stationary at the end of the runway at the conclusion of the landing, <laughs> ask the pilot to turn off the relativistic corrections to the global positioning system and just land using Newtonian physics instead. But please check that I am not on the aircraft at the time. <laughs> and this is the connection between Einstein and the jumbo jet. Thank you very much. Yes, the, freak, the colour of the light can change because in, in exactly the same way that the pitch of light uh, of um, sound changes because of the Doppler effect. They're, they're actually, the, the maths is actually a lot simpler when you describe light compared to sound. The sound, sound is rather messy because you've got to worry about the speed of sound in the air and then your speed relative to the air and the speed of the source relative to the air. It's rather complicated, but it, for light all you have to worry about is your relative speed because there's no medium to worry about and so the, but the, the physics is very, very similar. In fact, the Doppler shift uh, with light is one of the most important tools of uh, astronomy now, in, uh, measuring the expansion of the universe and uh, pulsars uh, orbiting each other and all sorts of other fantastic uh, phenomena. you can measure relative positions to phenomenal accuracy. But you, there's no such thing as an absolute position. You know, there's no answer to the question, well, where am I really? Yeah. Well, relative to what? Yeah. Yeah, that's the answer. Yeah. The, uh, I'm not quite sure if you're aware of it, the American military can, well, in fact, they have more accurate settings for their GPS than they do for the aircraft. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, um, the uh, uh, subtleties of this are really quite profound. The, the signals that it picks up are in co have encoded in them the um, time information, the position information, and also decoding information to decode the signals in the first place, because that, the signal-to-noise ratio is actually one, okay? It's one. And so you've got to try and pick out the useful information from the noise, and you need a, a pseudo-random binary sequence in order to do that, which is transmitted by the satellites into the microcomputer in here. And then there's a second sequence, which if it's a military one, it can decode and get uh, more accurate information. And this particular unit actually um, tells you how accurate the signal that it's receiving is. It gives you a measure, because the uh, accuracy of the, the public access signal uh, changes all the time. And this sometimes is very, very accurate, and it tells you, and other times it's not so accurate and lets you know. So yeah, it's, uh, uh, but you can actually, you can short circuit that by um, having a transmitter 
that is fixed to the ground somewhere, like in the control tower of the airport. And that transmitter receives the global positioning system, calculates the error in the signal, which might only be a couple of hundred metres, and then transmits that correction signal to the aircraft so that the aircraft can subtract off the error and know exactly where they are to within centimetres. And that's what you need if you're going to do a Category 3 landing. So that's called differential global positioning system. In, in, in the sort of Yeah. Because they're so accurately keeping track, or they could be plus or minus a degree, or which that a couple of miles or something like that, which was still within tolerances. But now there's the airplanes just fly straight over each other all day. Yeah. I, I also heard that this means the end of all the established airways, that from now on an aircraft will take off and it'll fly in the shortest possible track from A to B. It won't f fly over the recommended path with everyone tr that it has to report in at all these waypoints. It'll just go... In that's not quite here, but that's what yeah. So that could be hazardous, because you never know where anyone is anymore. They're all travelling the shortest possible path, and it could be a bit chaotic. You'd hope, you, well, you, the aircraft will know where it is, and then it would hopefully transmit that information to anyone in the vicinity who's listening. That's the uh, important part. Because the other aircraft don't know where it is. It has, it has to transmit its present location. Or transmit it back to a central control, who then retransmits it back to the original aircraft to uh, warn it if it gets close to somebody. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm sorry I don't know that number. That's, uh, no, I'm sorry. I think it is very high. In fact, I've got the manual down here. I could look it up for you afterwards if you're interested. Yeah, no, I, the, I, I must say I'm not very well up on the engineering <laughs> details of the transmitters. It's a fascinating story, though, in its own right, too, because the, there are problems with the ionosphere of the Earth and uh, you know, all sorts of things. It's the, the frequency has to be chosen quite carefully to, for all that. No, they have a variety of. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know about polar orbits. Uh, probably, um, but the the orbits are designed so that there's always um, four or more satellites visible from any point on the Earth at any one time. At least four. This this gadget actually um, tells you how many satellites it's locked into, and I think I can maybe uh, bring this up on the screen. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work inside the building because the building shields the uh, radio signal. But if I just turn it on for you, um, first of all, it uh, uh, yeah, okay, it's not tracking. I'll just turn the navigation on for a sec. But uh, this, these are the coordinates I last uh, read, which was out on the crown out there. You can see the AQU appear in the top corner there, which means it's listening out for whatever satellites happen to be in the vicinity. And uh, this screen here I've just uh, moved to tells you it's, it can't hear any satellites at the moment and it's waiting to pick up a, a satellite signal. And that number goes to one, then it goes to two as it locks in, and then three, and then four, and then finally five sometimes as it locks in five separate satellites. And these numbers down the bottom here, uh, this number is a measure of the accuracy that's being transmitted at the moment. And that's at the, at the, you're at the mercy of the military authorities. GPS authorities, because it's half civil and half military now. And this number over here is a measure of the signal-to-noise uh, quality. But it, it's not going to find any satellites here. 
Yeah, absolutely, yes. And the, the, yeah, and the uncertainty goes down. Well, there's a Russian there's a Russian system as well called uh, Glomass, I think it is, um, and some enterprising uh, manufacturers of these devices have made, made them lock into either system uh, to give you uh, extra accuracy. Um, but uh, the there there are plans to upgrade the system to more powerful transmitters and more more satellites to improve accuracy, and in fact. Um, Every astronomer on the planet, every radio astronomer on the planet is fighting a rearguard action against this because it's blocking out large uh, amounts of the radio sky. But I think the commercial imperatives are so strong because it's just so useful for absolutely everything you can think of. In fact, I, I even read a paper where they proposed uh, blind people would have GPS systems. And, you know, you'd be walking down the, down the footpath and the, and the computer would be saying, Step a little left here, a little to the right there, a little left, go around the corner here. Just watch out for that tree. Absolutely amazing uh, possibilities if you can get centimetre accuracy. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what happens. I say, well, how will the people on Earth observe a certain amount of energy? Should I observe more energy? Will I try in my blind saucer? You, you will indeed. If, the, the visi if you go fast enough, as you uh, propose, close to the speed of light, then the visible light that you see, uh, that, that the visible light that I see, you will see shifted into the gamma uh, gamma radiation wavelength, so I'd advise very efficient uh, shielding on your spaceship if you're planning to do this because the gamma rays will cut your DNA to pieces. So, Ray-Bans, no, not effective at all. <laughs> no, sorry. It's coming from your kinetic energy relative to the source. <laughs> Actually, can I go for a ride? You know, bring, <laughs> bring it around to my place. I'll come with you. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, light due to the, uh, not the, the timing of the clock due to gravity is, uh, like the higher the gravity, the slower the clock. Therefore, the higher you put your clock, the effectively it's a bit faster than a clock on Earth. And alternatively, the faster the space should be, uh, vehicle moves, the slower the clock, due to, again, due to relativistic uh, uh, effects. Okay. Hasn't there been discussion when they put the system into effect to try and cancel the two effects out? Of course, it's the other effect as well. To try that those two effects cancel out so you get the... Uh, no, the, sat the satellites would have to go too fast. You, you'd have to put, put them too close to the surface of the Earth. In fact, I'm not... Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting idea, and in fact, there are subtleties about actually the shape of the Earth and its rotational speed in that um, I, I think I'm right in saying that the gravitational blue shift is exactly balanced by the changing speed of the surface of the Earth as you walk towards the pole for, for movement on the surface of the Earth because the Earth bulges. And so the gravity is stronger at the equator than it is at the pole. I think that's correct. And the two of... Pardon? It's the other way around? Okay, well, I think I'm a bit hazy on this, as you can see, but I think the two effects do cancel as, because of the Earth's not being spherical. But I think it's not practical for the satellite system. I, as far as I know from my reading of the literature, there's no problem programming the clocks on the satellites to compensate for these effects. So it's 
built into the engineering, into the software. Just before uh, we conclude, uh, I'd like to thank uh, David Delahoy of uh, Delahoy Engineering for your precision fitting and turning needs, for lending me his uh, GPS unit. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate that uh, very much. And also, I'd like to think, thank uh, Nick and uh, Steve for uh, setting up all the gear. $2, a copy as usual. Uh, oh, uh, would you mind? Uh, I'll get um, Andrew.